together with I think six or seven other other astronauts who were on board the the space shuttle Columbia. Um, with us this evening, presenting about this wonderful um, Israeli hero, is our guest speaker um, Tuvia Book. Tuvia uh, was born in the UK. Um, but when he was just a baby, his parents emigrated to South Africa. Um, and I have that in common with Tuvia because um, when I was 10, my parents also emigrated to South Africa where we spent about six years living there. Um, so Tuvia grew up in South Africa for, for more years than I did. And then when he was 17, he went to, um, he made Aliyah and he, um, he then, he volunteered for the IDF He's, well, before that, he studied in yeshiva, and then he volunteered for the IDF and served in a, an elite combat unit. Um, upon his discharge from that unit, he completed a BA at Bar Ilan University and also certification in graphic design. Tuvia also then served as an information officer at the Israeli consulate in Philadelphia, whilst he also um, studied towards a graduate degree in Jewish studies. After he did that, after he completed that, that graduate degree, he then returned to Israel and graduated from a course of study with the Israel Ministry of Tourism. And today, amongst many, many other things, he's a licensed tour guide there. Um, Tuvia has spent much of his, his adult life working in the field of Jewish education and um, has served as a, an emissary, a shaliach, for the Sochnut, the Jewish Agency for Israel, um, he served as their director of Israel and Zionist education at the Board of Jewish Education of Greater New York. Um, he's been a lecturer and educational guide at the Alexander Muss Institute for Israel Education in Israel for over a decade and has lectured at both Bar Ilan University and the Hebrew U. Um, he's authored um, several books, one of which is entitled For the Sake of Zion. Um, which is a curriculum of Israel studies. And another one is Moral Dilemmas of the Modern Israeli Soldier. Um, so I would recommend you seeking those out and, and reading them. Um, so it, it's very clear that we have a very talented and very experienced guide with us tonight. So without further ado, um, just before I pass you over to Tuvia, all I would ask is that um, everyone turn off their video their individual video and to mute their audio just so that we can focus on 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 our speaker and you'll be um you're free to send any questions to submit any questions via the chat facility and we'll um well we'll sort of remind you periodically throughout the next half an hour to 40 minutes whilst Tuvia presents about Ilan Ramon to to submit any questions so um Please, you know, as, as I've just said, please do um, help us out by turning off your videos and turning off your, your audio and sit back and enjoy. So without further ado, I hand you over to Dr. Tuvia Book. Hello and good evening. Do you have, am I on a co-share, Steve? Sorry? Yes. I was just checking out in a co-share, co-host. Okay. Yes. I'll share the screen yes. soon. Okay, yes. excellent. All right, good evening, everybody. So after that introduction, uh, you won't be surprised to be hearing the Queen's English. Um, I try not to talk with too heavy South African accents so you can understand me. But what I'm going to be talking about tonight is an individual who basically redefines a co very common used word. Usually when you use the word hero, we think about, you know, so-and-so is a hero because he scored the last minute of a football game or this or that. The true definition of a hero can be summed up in one word and that is selflessness, utter total selflessness. Um, to put everything above yourself. Ilan Ramon was such an individual. Ilan Ramon, Colonel Ilan Ramon, I had the distinct pleasure of meeting a few months before his mission. As Steve mentioned, I was serving as an emissary as Shaliach in, in New York. Um, and we had a meeting of all the Jewish agency Shlichim. It was actually up in Philadelphia. And Ilan Ramon was the guest speaker. And they introduced him. And they gave such an introduction. Colonel Ilan Ramon, Israel's first astronaut, the hero of the Iraqi uh, nuclear reactor um, 
operation. And by the time they'd finished the introduction, we expected someone to walk in six foot six tall with a leather flying jacket and aviation spectacles and cool background music. Instead, this little guy walked in with a huge smile in his face from ear to ear, spoke to us for 20 minutes and didn't once speak in the first person. That's what I remember most about his speech. He always talked about we and the Jewish people and the Israelis and the enterprise of all of us together. It was just phenomenally humble and yet a lot not to be humble about. And I remember that incredible feeling as all over the world, everybody stopped. Suddenly all the Jews are united, Israelis, Jews around the world to watch the first time ever an Israeli astronaut go to space. And just to think what he symbolized, literally the son and grandson of Holocaust survivors were liberated from Auschwitz. And here he is, not wearing a yellow star, but wearing proudly a blue star on his sleeve and going up to touch the stars. It was this, the emotion was incredible. And I remember as we all rushed to our televisions two weeks later after Shabbat to watch the, the shuttle land and the shock and the horror when we saw that just 16 minutes before uh, the landing time, the shuttle imploded and exploded and the shock was felt around the world, not just amongst the Jewish people, of course, but for anyone who understood the very best of humanity had been aboard that shuttle. Now, with these stories, uh, it helps start logically at the beginning. So I'm gonna to switch to a slide presentation show right now, and I'm gonna talk through the slides so we understand the remarkable journey that Lan Ramon took in his life. Even though he only lived for 49 years, he managed to accomplish more in those 49 years than most of us could dream of accomplishing, and not in one, but in two lifetimes, a life packed with meaning and purpose. So, dramatic pause. Okay. Here we go. Okay, we'll start off with the Israeli Air Force itself. Ilan Ramon started his career off in the Israeli Air Force as a pilot. Now you look at this unusual picture over here, especially because this part of it's very unusual. Um, and everyone knows that Israel has a mandatory draft. You don't have a choice. Unless you're also orthodox, uh, you can get an exemption based on Torah learning. And most do, even though not everyone does. But most Israelis are drafted at the age of 18. The one unit you can't be drafted to, of course, is the Israeli Air Force Pilots course they have to send you an invitation. And what's that invitation based on? It's based on three things. One is your ability academically. The other, of course, is your social ability and your physical ability. And if you qualify, you get this invitation. In Hebrew, it's called a zimun letais. So an invitation for the pilot's course. Now, just because you get the invitation, it doesn't mean you can go out and buy your aviator glasses and leather jacket. It means you're invited to start the course. It is the most difficult course in the Israeli military. It is a three year training course. And when you finish, you also finish with an undergraduate degree in aeronautical engineering as well. And you have to commit to another 10 years of service. So it's massive. And people ask, why is it such a long course? One of the reasons, of course, is sheer dollars and cents. The new F-35 Israel just uh, purchased cost each airplane $100 million. Now that is a real chunk of change. The F-16s that the Land Ramon flew only cost only $60 million. And that's just the way that Israel was seeing them before they actually went and uh, revamped the entire airplane. So basically you have a situation here where it costs $3 million to train a pilot. Now, in case you think petrol is expensive, um, $14,000 is the price. In Hebrew, it's called the Shat Tisa, one hour's flying time cost. So only the best of the best of the best become pilots. And Ilan Ramon was one of those. Not only was he accepted to the course and finished the course, he was also the cadet of honor. Now, the reason I'm starting with this particular picture, you'll notice there's a girl in the middle over here, a female. And until about 10 years ago, no females were allowed inside the course. And all that changed when... Um, all that changed when an Ola, an immigrant from South Africa called Alice Miller came and said she wanted to be a pilot. And they said, you can't, and they're like, why not? Said, because you're a woman. And she said, so what? She said, we don't allow women to be pilots. So what did this plucky young immigrant do, who by the way, already had a civilian pilot's license. She went and took the Air Force High Command, it's Supreme Court, took out 
we wouldn't help her to look at Isol's constitution because Isol does not have a constitution. Instead, she went and brought in the Declaration of Independence and read one sentence. It said, the state of Israel uh, will treat equally every citizen without distinction of gender, race, or religion. And based on that one sentence, they opened up the pilot's course to women on one condition. If you want equality, the condition is you have equality, have the same course as the men. There's not a separate course of men, there's not a separate course of women. There's not 10 push-ups for men and five for women. Equality is equality. So she basically went and she finished the course and she got into the course, but did she finish it? And the answer is no, because life isn't a Disney film. And uh, instead she went uh, and got in, but opened the gates for other women. And a couple of years after her, the first woman to finish the course was uh, a famous, famous woman who was the granddaughter of uh, people who'd fought in the Warsaw Ghetto. And so basically, because of this one woman, she changed the entire culture of Israel's Air Force. And Lan Ramon also is an individual that made a huge difference in life. He started off uh, by finishing the course as the Gadet of Honor. Now in a remarkable, remarkable um, um, current uh, turn of affairs, a generation later, his son, who we'll talk about briefly, Asaf, also finishes the Cadet of Honor. This has only ever happened once in the Israeli Air Force, the Cadet of Honor for the entire Air Force course. Now, what made Ilan Roman jump to fame? That was something that happened in 1981. I presume you guys can all see this map. And again, you're all welcome to share uh, comments on the chat section. Um, and we will read them afterwards and answer the questions. So if you look at this map over here, you notice there's a red line from Elat to a place called Ostsirak. Now, today in the Middle East, we have a situation where there's a country starting with I that threatens to destroy Israel if it acquires nuclear uh, potential. That country is called Iran. And one thing we've learned as Jews, if someone says they're gonna destroy uh, the Jewish state, believe them. Um, back in 1981, there was a country next door called Iraq who were this close to building a nuclear reactor. It had been built by good friends of French people and they were literally a few weeks away from becoming operational. Israel's prime minister at the time, Menachem Begin, um, said to the head of the Air Force Command, when he called him and said, listen, um, my sister and my parents were killed in the Holocaust and my watch there will not be a second Holocaust. Is there any way that we can stop this reactor becoming operational? The head of the Air Force called in his head of operational commanding, a guy called Ilan Ramon, the Ilan Ramon, and said, how can we stop this? Ilan went away to his lonely riders gallery and came back with a crazy plan. And this was his plan, guys. He said, we are gonna fly, we can. The only way to stop this reactor going operational is to fly 2,000 kilometers over enemy territory, fuel one the way their way back with eight 16s flying tip to tip at 400 feet at 100 meters, 120 meters above the earth. So they won't show up on the radar with an F 15 escort. Then we're going to go into the nuclear reactor site and we're going to take it out to specially developed bunker buster bombs. And the last plane in is the most dangerous plane because the element of surprise has been lost. When we turn around to come back, we need to fly 2,000 kilometers back. We can't refuel, or we might just land on the fumes of our petrol, providing we haven't been shot down over the reactor. Now, it sounds like mission impossible. And then Ilan Ramon paused and said, I would like to volunteer on the mission, and I would like to be the last pilot in. And everybody was shocked, and they said to him, well, we don't understand. We just described mission impossible. What do you mean you want to be the last pilot in? And he said, he said, I, I just, one second here. I'm just having a technical glitch over here. Hold on. One second. Okay. 
Yeah, back with you guys. Okay, so he said um, to Menachem Begin, that my mother and grandmother were the sons of Holland, where the were my mother and grandmother were in Auschwitz and wore yellow star. I now have a blue star and can stop a second Holocaust. I want to be on this mission. And Megan agreed. He went on the mission against all the odds. Not only did he succeed, but all the planes got back safely to Israel. Of course, the whole world condemned Israel and including the United States under Reagan. But 10 years later, in 1991, when the United States invaded Iraq, they were extremely happy that Iraq did not have nuclear potential. And they even wrote a letter of thanks to uh, the state of Israel at the time, General Schwarzkopf. So let's go to the next slide. And we see here how the Israeli F-16s flew wingtip to wingtip just above the earth. It's an incredible, incredible photo here and an incredible flying to fly 4,000 kilometers, 2,000 kilometers there and back uh, in in such an, um, an amazing mission. And the, at the bottom here is Elan Ramon, the way he looked as a young pilot then on this particular mission. Okay, this here is a photo montage of Elan Ramon during his Air Force service. At the bottom right, you see him as a young pilot. And then later on, you see him as he grows older flying these F-16s. And the picture on the top left is the way that he looked when he was selected to become Israel's first astronaut. Now, when he was selected, he realized that he was representing not just Ilan Ramon, private individual, but he was also representing two other things. He was representing the Jewish state itself, the state of Israel, and also Holocaust survivors and their children. Not only that, but he was also representing the Jewish people. And he was very aware of the symbolic aspect of his mission to such an extent that uh, even next to his name, as you can see on the mission patch, he insisted they put the Israeli flag next to his name. He also had an Israeli flag on his astronaut uniform on his sleeve. He literally wore it on his sleeve. And when he took his uniform off, he had a shirt with the Israeli flag on it. So here's someone who wore his passion on his sleeve and on his heart. Now, every astronaut is allowed to take something to space with them. And Ilan Ramon decided that he was going to take a um, number of symbolic objects with him. First of all, he didn't grow up religious at all. He grew up, uh, he grew up totally secular. Uh, and he basically um, spoke fluent Hebrew. He, he served in the Israeli military. But like many secular Jews in Israel, um, he, didn't, um, he didn't have much religious education. So he went to uh, Houston to start his astronaut training. It took three years. He went to the Chabad house in Houston, spoke to the local rabbi there and said, listen, I'm Israeli, but I'm a Hebrew speaking uh, non-Jew basically. I don't really know too much about Jewish practices. And it's important to me because I'm going to represent the entire Jewish people to be part of the um, uh, Jewish traditions to be part of my mission. So he, was, he wasn't the first Jewish astronaut, by the way. He was the first Israeli astronaut. He was also the first astronaut that ordered kosher food, even though he himself did not keep kosher. It was that important for him to have kosher food on the um, mission itself because he was representing the Jewish people. Also, he took a Kiddush cup with him, and we'll talk about that a bit later. And many Jewish significant objects, including a mezuzah, uh, with the outside of it designed by a Holocaust survivor, which had barbed wire on and the letter Shin, show how the Jews would come through everything. But everyone knows that the most incredible item he took with him, I'm going to show you a picture of it right now, is this one. If you look in his hand, this is a day before he was, uh, a day before the end of the mission, he held up in his hand for the whole world to see a teeny, teeny Sefer Torah. Now, not just any Torah, this Torah had literally been to, um, to the Holocaust. And the story how he came by it and how he came to be holding it is an incredible story, a story that's difficult to believe. And yet sometimes the truth is most definitely stranger than fiction. So in this particular case, um, one of Elan's missions on the shuttle was to carry out an experiment on something which is very um, important, which is the issue of global warning. Israel had an experiment called the Midex experiment, and they were going to basically um, check out how dust storms formed in the Middle East and how that affected global warming. And the University of Tel Aviv was sponsoring the experiment. So Elan Ramon went to the uh, professor in the University of Tel Aviv, and he said to him, his name was Professor Yosef Yoyachin, he said, listen, um, 
as he was talking to him, he looked behind the professor and saw that there was a shelf with a small cupboard, which was open and it contained a little Torah scroll. Now, anyone will, who've been to University of Tel Aviv will know it's not a bastion of Orthodox Judaism, and neither Ilan Maman or the professor were wearing a yidlid, a virtual skull cap. Um, and so, one of these things over here. Um, and so, basically, um, he said, Why do you have a toy in your room? It's most peculiar. The professor answered with a strange accent. He said, Actually, originally, I'm from Holland. And um, in Holland, uh, just before the war where I lived, we had a, um, a roundup and we were all taken to the Vesterbrook camp. And from there, taken to Bergen-Belsen. It was just before my bar mitzvah. And when we got to Bergen-Belsen, there was a rabbi in the camp, which was crazy. And even more crazy, he walked up to me and said, how would you like to read your bar mitzvah portion from a Torah scroll? And then my mom looked at him in shock and said, how can that be? How can there be a Torah? A Torah scroll in Bergen-Belsen. And the person I don't know, but there was. And he told me my Torah portion from this same little scroll. Just so far, I was supposed to read in the morning of my bar mitzvah. We were all in the barracks and we put up curtains on the windows so the Germans wouldn't see us. And this little scroll was open on the table and there was a knock at the door. We were sure we were sure being caught. And yet, when the door opened, we saw the camp underground had brought my mother to watch me read my bar mitzvah, the professor accounts. She saw me read my bar mitzvah and turned around and was taken back to her barracks and I never saw her again. At the end of the ceremony, the rabbi put the Torah into my hand and said, I probably won't survive, but you will. I want you to take this little Torah and I want you to promise to tell the world what happened here and to tell the world how our traditions and our Torah are what keeps us Jewish. Please promise. And this 13 year old boy, he's recounting years later, said, I promise. But never knew how he was going to fulfill that promise to the rabbi. Decades later, in walks in Anomon and says, I need to take this Torah to space. And the professor was incredibly moved. He said, for all my life, I've wondered how to fulfill my promise to this rabbi. And now billions of people are going to see this Torah. We're going to see my Torah from Bergen-Belsen and understand this is what keeps the Jewish people alive, our traditions, our community, our attachment to the land. And with deep emotion, he entrusted the Torah to Ilan Ramon. And Ilan Ramon, of course, held up this Torah and the whole world did see it. And for a little moment, it floated from his hands and he grabbed it and pulled it back again and showed it to the world. I'm now gonna pause my slide presentation and go to a short two minute video clip about this Torah. It's from a documentary called An Article of Hope. And this is just the trailer. And it, you see the actual footage of Ilan Ramon going up in the channel and holding the toy into space. Dramatic pause. Okay, so it's uh, not loading. I'm going to send the link to uh, Steve later and he'll send it to you guys who are on this tour. All right, so I wanted to show you this photo over here talking about symbolism of the Israeli Air Force. This is a picture on the 60th anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz where we see um, two Israeli F-15s flying over Auschwitz-Birkenau. Now, as we know, uh, there was no uh, Allied bombing of Auschwitz-Birkenau during the war, despite pleas by to Roosevelt and Churchill. Martin Gilbert even wrote a book called Auschwitz and the Allies, saying that the Allies had these aerial photos and they flew over the camp every day, and they gave many reasons why they couldn't. And 60 years later, Israeli Air Force planes flew over the ruins of Auschwitz, and promised to be the shield of Israel, it would never happen again. Ilan Ramon was part of this legacy. Another thing that Ilan Ramon took with him, of course, is this picture. He went to Yad Vashem and he said, I'd like to take a picture drawn by a child who was killed in the Holocaust with me to space. And he saw this picture by Peter Gintz. Peter Gintz was a 
Jewish boy born in Prague, incredibly artistically talented. And at the age of uh, 12, he was deported to Theresienstadt uh, ghetto. And for two years, uh, he edited the children's newspaper and illustrated it. And there was an incredibly heroic art teacher in Theresienstadt, who when she was deported to Theresienstadt had taken one thing with her, and that was a suitcase full of art supplies. And for two years, she wore lights to the children and they sat and they drew. And just before she was deported, the pictures were hidden and found after the war. And Ilan Mamon saw this picture and he was moved to great emotion because what this boy, Peter Pinsa, had drawn is the way he sees the world, almost like the John Lennon song, Imagine. Imagine a world of no borders and no countries and no hatred. And here he was trapped inside this ghetto, imagining being on the moon and looking at the bright globe of the world where we can focus on peace and love, what we have in common, and not on hatred and death, but rather on life. Milan Ramon took a copy of this picture also with him to space as well amongst his symbolic objects. When he was floating above the planet Earth, he crossed over Israel. And when he flew over Israel, it was an incredible moment for him. And this is what he said. I'll read it in a, in, I'll translate it to English. I'll start in Hebrew and I'll translate it to English. It's an honor and a privilege for me to write this letter from space. Today, we flew over Israel. We saw clearly Jerusalem. And when we looked, and at the same time I was looking at our capital, I said a small prayer, Shema Yisrael. We are working for the goodness of all mankind. And from space, the whole world looks like one unit without borders. Therefore, I want to call from above. Let's work together. Let's work for peace. Let's work for a better life for everyone in this world. And that was Ilan Ramon's message. As he, as he stood here with his Israeli flag on his sleeve, his message was, we are all made in God's image. And when we are in space, we, that becomes much clearer. When we were moved far away, because we have to work for the greater good of all humanity. And every single person on the space shuttle with him was the best that humanity had. There was a, a doctor who was born in India. There was an African-American doctor. There was incredible American astronauts. And every single one represented a putting aside what divides us and focusing on what we have in common. It was an incredible mission. The people on it were all incredible. Uh, and Elan Ramon himself was the best that we have to offer. Of course, when the shuttle crashed, no one knew exactly what the cause was. Nobody understood what had happened. What had actually happened, of course, was when the shuttle took off, it, um, there were a small piece of foam broke off the, the booster rocket, knocked out a few heating towers in the left wing, and for two weeks, it was flying in space as a death trap. And only when it landed and it went through Earth's atmosphere, it, it wings superheated and the whole shuttle exploded. But no one knew exactly that a billion dollar space shuttle had been brought down by four broken heating tiles initially. And so for months afterwards, they were searching the debris to try and understand what had caused it. And as they were searching, trying to piece it together, about two months afterwards, a Navajo tracker found this a scrumpled piece of paper in a field in Texas. And when he looked closely, he saw that there was symbols on it, but they weren't in English, they weren't mathematical numbers. He thought maybe some kind of NASA code. He didn't know what it was. Now don't forget this piece of paper here, this crumpled mass of paper had survived an explosion at 20,000 feet, 10,000 degrees centigrade, had lain in a field for two months and somehow was still legible, which itself is almost beggars belief. And they sent the scrumpled piece of paper as is to NASA. <coughs> and clearly there was a Jewish rocket scientist there because they recognized that the squiggles were actually Hebrew letters. And they figured out it must be something that Ilan Ramon himself wrote. So they started unscrumbling it and they found out it was actually 18 pages of a handwritten diary he'd written in space itself. And they were looking at it and the Hebrew letters started to come out. And eventually, he was very clear to see that it was handwriting. On the first page of the diary that Lam Ramon had kept in space, he wrote the following. Some of you might be familiar with the words. This is what he wrote. Yom HaShishi, Vayichulu HaShemayim Va'aretz V'chol Tzva'am. 
On the sixth day, God created the heavens and the earth and all of the stars. And people were shocked. It's written the words of the Friday night Kiddush. And the big question, of course, is why did the Lanaman on the first day of his diary in space, on the first page, write the words of the Friday night Kiddush? And the answer, of course, is he didn't know it from, from, uh, from birth. He didn't know um, how much, uh, how the words went. So he wrote it down because he said, I'm going to say Kiddush in space. And he, said, he spoke to the, to the, the Bavich, the Chabad rabbi in Houston and said, how do I say Kiddush in space? And the Chabad rabbi said, well, this is a bit of a problem because when you're in space, every 60 days is Rosh Hashanah. Every uh, 14 hours is uh, Shabbat. What do we do? We have a problem, Jerusalem. But of course, there's the halachot, there's the Jewish laws, also for astronauts in space. And they figured about when he should be saying it. And he said it. Now imagine being in space and surrounded by heavens and earth and stars and saying those words that we mumble every Friday night. It was the sixth day and God created the heavens and the earth and all of the stars and seeing them all around you. What a magic moment that must have been. And even more magic is this actually survived, that incredible uh, infiltration, the massive flaming. Of course, how were the, the big question is how were the astronauts identified? And the answer is their dental records. Here we have a picture over here of Ilan Ramon's oldest son, Asaf, with his widow, Rona. And this is when Ilan Ramon's body comes back to Israel. Asaf was 16 years old. And he said, I would like to be like my father. Now that's the most incredible thing as a parent when your child wants to be like you. And Ilan Ramon's son, Asaf, very much wanted to follow his father's footsteps. He wanted to be a pilot. He wanted to be an astronaut. Um, and Ilan Ramon was killed at the tragically young age of 49. He left behind a widow and four children. Now on the one hand, when you sit and go to Shiva house, you don't talk about how somebody died. You talk about how they lived and what they did in their life. And Ilan Ramon managed to pack his life with so much meaning and so much purpose that it was just incredible. But the, the sad facts are four young children were left behind of which Asaf was the oldest. Now in Israel, if you want to serve in the combat unit, the military, and you've already lost a first degree relative, you need the permission of a parent. And Mona Ramon had to give Asaf permission to become a fighter pilot. And incredibly, as we mentioned before, Asaf Ramon, here he is in his graduation, also was a cadet of honor at his graduation as well. Uh, very much motivated by his, his father's uh, legacy and his father's life, he himself strove to be the best of the best. Here he is, been given his award by the late Shimon Peres, the president of the state of Israel. And over here is every picture that a mother wants to see. Uh, Rona kissing her son Asaf at the graduation of the uh, pilot's course. Now, this next page is something that is unbelievable. They say lightning doesn't strike twice. Well, in this case, it did. It says here, in their lives and in their deaths. And there's a picture of Ilan Ramon and his son Asaf. Because unbelievably, uh, on the 14th of September, 2009, uh, Asaf Ramon's F-16 plane uh, disintegrated in a, in a training accident and he was killed. Here's his family who's already paid the ultimate price of Elan himself dying in honor of the state of Israel and his tragedy. And then just a few years later, Rona herself loses her, not only her husband, her oldest son as well. It's unbelievable. The Israeli newspapers the next day were full of this. People were in total shock. It says on the right here, Goral Echad, one fate for everyone. And Kamar Abba, he was like his dad in, in every way where people strove for the best of what's good for the Jewish people of the state of Israel and both ended their life tragically early. And that's not even the end of the, uh, of, the, um, of the Ramon tragic story because just a year after Israel's latest airport in Elat, the Ilan and Asaf Ramon airport was opened by Rona Ramon herself. She herself succumbed to cancer at the tragically young age of 54, leaving three children behind. Now, the last day that Ilan Ramon was uh, able to send a message to his uh, family, he sent them a song. And the song was, 
a song written by Rachel the Poetess, incredibly well-known song in Israel uh, called Zemen Noga. And in it, prophetically, this is the song he sent to his wife the day before his last day on earth. Of course, nobody knows how long they're going to live for. Uh, we should live every day like it's our last, but we always assume we have a whole life ahead of us. And this is what he said to his wife. Listen to my voice, my distant one. Listen to my voice wherever you are. It's a voice that cries in, in strength, a voice that cries with tears and everything else that commands you a prayer. I'm going to switch now to the English version of it. And this is the last email that he wrote to his wife and this is what's written inside it. We meet for a moment and separate forever. My final days are very close. Near is the day of goodbye tears. I will wait for you until my life will end, like Rachel waited for her beloved. And of course, he didn't know that that was going to be his last day. He didn't know when he held up the Torah, that was going to be the last day that Torah was seen. And the Torah itself also vanished, just like uh, Ilan Ramon and the astronauts on the space shuttle itself. And really, that, as if it had been, that had been the purpose of the Torah. For decades, this Torah sat in the professor's study, waiting for the world to see it. And Ilan Ramon took up this Torah, and he showed the world that against all of the odds, what had allowed the Jewish people to survive were three things. One is our sense of tradition, our shared tradition, our Torah, the Torah itself, that we took with us everywhere we went, in good times to bad times, from Australia to Afghanistan. We had our Torah, we had our traditions. The second thing he taught us all is our community, Torah Yisrael, Am Yisrael, the nation of Israel, the people of Israel. Just like in medieval times, you could go to a synagogue in any city in the world, and you'd be welcomed in, and if you were going into trouble, you'd be redeemed by the local community. Even today, we have this thread that connects all of Jewish communities together, wherever we live, we're all brothers and sisters. Am Yisrael, Torah Yisrael. But the mortar that holds those two bricks together was what Ilan Roman himself represented. That, of course, is the land of Israel itself, Eretz Yisrael, Midinat Yisrael. Ilan Roman represented all three of these things with his Israeli flags, with his background as the son and grandson of Holocaust survivors, with his achievements as a pilot, as an astronaut. He wanted us all to know that his mission was deeply symbolic. It wasn't just a man going to space. It wasn't just Ilan Ramon going to space, rather it was an Israeli Jew, like a phoenix from the ashes. The state of Israel itself rose after the Holocaust, and so did Ilan Ramon go up into space and vanish in a blaze of glory. Now again, no one knows how long they've got to live. We could live a long, meaningless life. We could live a short life packed in meaning. What Ilan Ramon taught us is make sure that every single day counts. Pack every life with purpose and meaning. And most importantly, not just for yourself. Our role of Jews in this world is to make sure that we leave a better world behind us. Just as Ilan Ramon's experiment was about global warming, so we should also strive to make a better world. But the things that do remain behind after us, what is our eternity itself? Ilan Ramon taught us this lesson as well. Our three things, our children, Ilan Ramon's children in this case, or our own children, our Yiladim, our Masim Tovim, our good deeds, and uh, of course, um, what we create to make this world better. And Ilan Ramon, in his 49 years, taught us all this incredible lesson that we should always strive for the betterment of our people, our state, our religion, and the planet that we live in. Ladies and gentlemen, I want to thank you for joining us. I want to thank the Zionist Federation uh, for sponsoring this talk. And I'm welcome for any questions. Over to you guys. Okay, thank you, uh, Tovia. That was a very, um, a very heartwarming, very bittersweet um, recollection of, of a, like you say, a, a very selfless um, and amazing Israeli Israeli man, uh, a hero. Um, you mentioned and you showed an image of um, Asaf, his mm -hmm. eldest son, and uh, his widow Rona, standing um, by what looked like a coffin. But then you, you also mentioned, if I'm not mistaken, that nothing was found from the, from the wreckage. Um, 
So, so are we to assume that his body was never recovered? You mentioned well, what, that Zora was never found. Mm -hmm. Well, what they did found, which allowed positive identification, is they found jaw bones, and they could tell by the dental records who they belonged to. So that's why in Israel, normally when you die, you're buried right into the ground with a talit. The only exception, of course, are IDF soldiers who are buried in coffins with the Israeli flag on them, because unfortunately, sometimes their body itself is in the hole. And in this case with Elan Ramon, there was a positive identification, a part of his body, which was what's inside this coffin draped with the Israeli flag that right. was brought, sent back to the United States. By the way, he's buried in a, in a halal cemetery in the Moshav, where Moshe Dayan grew up, uh, which is also next to his Air Force base in Ramat David, and his son is buried in the grave next to him. Wow. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you. And uh, we have a question here from Sam Sagar, who's in the audience. Um, okay. Sorry, no, not from Sam, Sam Sagar. Uh, sorry, from Bernard Glass, um, who's, okay. asked, who's asked how was uh, Ilan chosen for the mission? Did he volunteer? And um, perhaps you could explain a little bit about that. Okay, well, it was just when President Clinton uh, spoke to Shimon Peres, he said, listen, our countries are really striving towards peaceful cooperation together, and we have an opening as a payload specialist in a shuttle mission coming up in two years' time. Uh, would you like to select someone? So Peres, Shimon Peres, spoke to the head of the Israeli Air Force and said, do you have anyone in mind? And every single person in the Air Force said the same name. They all said Ilan Ramon. It was just a consensus, unanimous consensus, consensus where people basically, there was no other candidate. He'd already shown his bravery, he'd shown his patriotism, and he'd, most importantly, he'd shown his uh, utter and total uh, love of the state of Israel and the Jewish people, and uh, his technical competence as well. In fact, he was so incredibly uh, technically competent that he was upgraded from payload specialist to mission specialist uh, during his training. Quite a, that's quite an upgrade. Um, oh. We have another uh, another question here, quite a general question about Ilan, uh, about Ilan um, from Corrie oh. Penn. Um, do we know much about his childhood? Um, oh. you, you spoke of his his um, secular nature. That's that's presumably because his his parents raised him as as such. Oh. Um, does that perhaps his secular nature? Does that does that have anything to do with um, his mother having come through the Holocaust and perhaps having lost any you know some faith? It's a very good question. At the end of the day, his father. His, by the way, Lan Ramon's name was changed when he went to the Air yeah. Force. His, his his birth name was Volfovich, actually. Mm. Uh, his father hadn't been to the Holocaust. His father was a Sabra who actually fought his old war of independence. So he had two very different kinds of parents. On the one hand, the mother and grandmother who'd been from Auschwitz to Israel, and the father who was the uh, labor Zionist yeah, Sabra who, who fought in all of the wars. We always had that question about nature and nurture. Mm -hmm. In this case, uh, Ilan Mom was raised in the suburb uh, of Omer, which is the suburb of uh, Be'er Sheva. Uh, where there's a lot of intellectuals, a lot of academics, uh, a lot of people who work in Soka Hospital, the doctors live in this particular suburb. Uh, and he was given an incredible top class secular education. As far as faith after the Holocaust, it's a, it's a difficult question to answer, um, you know, and, and to understand as well. My late grandfather lost his entire family in the Shoah. And when he came to England, he was a Hasidic Jew, shaved off his beard and his peyot. Um, but still remains traditional. Some people, it strengthens them, some people are weak in them. In Lan Ramon's case, he grew up as a proud, patriotic, Zionist Israeli, but religion was very much um, uh, not part of his upbringing, and that's why he did a fast catch-up course when he went to Houston, realizing he was representing not just Israelis, but also the Jewish people. Um, we, have another, we have another question here. Um, now, know that, sorry, whoever has their audio on, um, please switch it off as we're hearing quite a bit of feedback via that. Thank you. Um, so we have another question here from, from Bernard Glass. Um, look, we're, we're all aware um, that Ilan Ramon uh, uh, was Israel's first astronaut and, and thus far he's been their only astronaut. Um, but Bernard Glass asks, is it true that there have been many Jewish astronauts 
So not necessarily Israeli, obviously, but Jewish astronauts. There have been some Jewish ones, but none of them were overtly Jewish. None of them had also come to food before. And none of them, and in a tr tremendous parallel, tragic parallel, the only other shuttle disaster, of course, was the Challenger back in 1986 that exploded on takeoff. And the teacher, the civilian teacher, Judith Resnick, who was on that uh, shuttle flight, was also Jewish as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and there had been two other American Jewish astronauts, but again, none of them were practicing observing, and none of them took any symbolic uh, articles to space with them. They were basically born Jewish, but weren't practicing Jews. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. And then we have um, another question here, which, look, you know, you <laughs> is um, perhaps not not something that you can answer um, with 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 great um, great certainty. But Mark Newman has asked, um, when do you think we'll see the first Israeli astronaut to land on the moon and to land on <laughs> Mars? <laughs> well, Mark Mark Newman's guess is as good as mine. <laughs> <laughs> we almost landed a spaceship on the moon. It actually did land, but like in typical yeah. Israeli fashion, it crash landed uh, <laughs> last year. But it was incredible we even got it to the moon itself. Yeah. And the glitch was caused by the British made engine, but we'll talk no more about that. <laughs> <laughs> and um, just, uh, just on that subject, then, Tuvia, are there, um, I'm, I'm sure I've read over the past year that there have been plans to sort of you know, attempt that again to, to land a craft on the yes, the same, absolutely. The same guy who sponsored the first mission, he's he really, he's really put in the funds uh, for a second attempt as well. I mean, they really, they were so close. It was almost painful. Uh, we were missing, we were missing about four feet. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um. You spoke about um, Asaf, who, who very obviously, you know, followed in his father's footsteps, wanted to be like his Abba. Um, and, you know, we're, we're aware that there's there's three other children who, who survive, who survived them. Um, just a, a very brief question. Have any of them followed in Ilan's footsteps? Do you know? No, well, that's very interesting. After Asaf was uh, killed, the press somehow got the news for his mother, which is just incredible. They were waiting outside the house when she came home and asked her what her thoughts were. And she hadn't actually officially been informed by the Air Force that her son had been killed. Mm -hmm. So after this tragedy, this heartless tragedy, there was a pact in Israel to mm -hmm. give utter and total privacy to the remaining three children. And yeah. that has been honored. And to the, that yeah. is the reason I, I or anyone in Israel knows nothing about the other three children because they've been given the privacy uh, that they they deserve. Absolutely, no, as they should, as they should. And um, we, I mean, I know, I know the answer and I suspect lots of you know other people in the audience may know, but for those who might not know, um, are there any monuments to, to Ilan Ramon in Israel? Okay, well, the, the best monuments are the living monuments. Ron, Ron and Mamon, in her short life before she passed, founded the Ilan, Ramon, uh, Ilan and Asaf Ramon Foundation, which encourages uh, lit, uh, children from both Muslim, Christian, and Jewish Israeli children to uh, scientific uh, experiments and discovery and basically gives scholarships to, to any Israeli citizens irrespective of their gender or religion who want to pursue a career in science and hopefully become Israel's second astronaut. So you have the Elan and Asaf Ramon Foundation. You also have in Mitzpe Ramon itself, uh, the visitor center was closed for many years and reopened a couple of years ago with a tremendously moving uh, exhibit on Elan and Asaf Ramon, including a film which actually has footage of the last conversation that he had with his family before the shuttle exploded from space itself. So that is well worth a visit next time yeah, you're in Israel, the Mitzpah Ramon Visitor Center. And uh, finally, as I mentioned before, uh, Israel's latest airport, just north of Elat. They closed down the, the old airport in Elat, they built a new airport a few kilometers further to the north, uh, state-of-the-art airport, which also with uh, the peace with Jordan, with one day we hope Jordanian and Israeli planes will both be using this airport. Uh, yes. It's situated right on the border in Arava, and that is called the official name, Yilan and Asaf uh, Ramon Airport. Mm -hmm. And anyone who lands in Ben Gurion Airport will notice the whole arrivals terminal is actually named the Ilan Ramon Terminal as well. 
Yeah, absolutely. How amazing. But of course, the most most importantly, just to finish off, is is the name itself. You know, the name of Elan Ramon and his legacy. You know, we, we learn as Jews, it doesn't matter how long you live, it matters what you do with the life that you live. And Elan Ramon's name is still spoken with awe and reverence uh, throughout Israeli society. For sure. Um, and and so so just a couple of more questions for you. Um, mm -hmm. In terms of uh, the the nuclear reactor, in in, mm -hmm. in terms of Ilan's place in in helping to destroy the nuclear reactor in Iraq, um, someone here, Ed, Edward Phelan, asks, mm -hmm. um, do you think Ilan? Do you think it can be be positive, for example, that Ilan Ramon helped prevent not only a war in the Middle East but perhaps even a world war? It's a very, very, it's one of, it's a very interesting question. And the answer I could say was probably yes, because we all know that um, 10 years after uh, the operation itself, uh, America launched Operation Desert Storm. And people always think that the next major war will, will break out somewhere in the Middle East. And if Saddam Hussein would have had nuclear capacity back in 1991 and the Israeli mission had failed, then the chances are those nuclear weapons might have been used against the United States. So this is all one of those what ifs. We will never know, of course. And they might have responded in kind and the Soviets might have been pulled in. Uh, and who knows what could have happened. But none of it happened because it was basically stopped before it became become operational. And also, if you talk about the what ifs, it would have become operational. That would have presented a clear and present danger to the state of Israel. And to this day, if any country, including Iran, uh, tries to get the potential to destroy the Jewish state, the reason we need to stop them is for something called the Begin Doctrine. And Menachem Begin said, they will never again, means never again, as long as there is a Jewish state. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Okay, well, thank you, Tovia. It's, um, you know, I'm seeing a, a few remarks in the chat that, you know, thanking you for an excellent presentation. Um, it's certainly been a very engaging one, uh, a very inspiring one despite the you know the tragedy of of Ilan's um life being brought to such a tragic end and obviously then his his eldest son and his wife um but it's it's nonetheless a very inspirational uh very inspirational story so thank you for joining us um, and everyone for for joining us this evening we hope you, you all enjoyed it and that you've each managed to take something you know, to have learned something in this um, and, and taken that away with you. So thank you very much. Be sure to look out um, for our newsletter and on our social media for, for future webinars. And um, I think that all that remains is to just say thank you to everyone. And again, thank you to Tuvia. Thank you very much, everyone. Yes, I'd, like thank, good night. I'd like to thank thank our sponsors. wish everyone a Shana Tova. Yes, Shana Tova, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.